Well, I was so drunk, I can't remember. <laughs> He was drunk. Two bucks was made. Uh huh. And the title is Wild Geese Three. <laughs> I used to refer to Tim as the man, the myth, the methane. <laughs> I wanted to pretend that I wasn't feeling a little jolly belly. <laughs> oh, I'm a fan of uh, Star Trek. You watched him during your lunch break at work. In 1864, with words. And now, we will explore it as well, with words and sounds, as we embark on a journey to the center of the Earth. In a moment, Leonard Nimoy. Hello, everybody. I'm Art Bell, and this is Coast to Coast AM. And what you just heard came from Leonard Nimoy's Journey to the Center of the Earth, which is a two-CD audio book by... Simon & Schuster, available from Simon & Schuster. He also has available the Time Machine, and you know me in time. So it was kind of a toss-up. Both of these two CD sets available from Simon & Schuster. In a moment, Leonard Nimoy, here for only a very short time, unfortunately. So we will pummel him with questions. <laughs> And now, I shouldn't have to introduce him. This is Leonard Nimoy. Leonard, welcome to the program. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, we have such a short time that I feel obligated to literally pummel you with questions. Okay, go. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, the character Mr. Spock came along in a time uh, in our country of peace, love, Woodstock, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Let it all hang out, that kind of time. Right. And, and yet, Spock was the picture of the very essence of self-control, self-denial, self-governance. How could that character have become such a hero in such an uncontrolled atmosphere? Well, for, it's a great question. I think for one thing, the, the time was, was uh, one where um, so many people were becoming cynical about government and authority figures. Uh, it was clear that the... That, uh, bureaucracy was not responding to the individual mm -hmm. and uh, the war in Vietnam was uh, was ongoing in spite of the fact that more and more and more people every day believed that it was wrong uh, we all believed in supporting our country but we believed that we shouldn't be in that war uh, and here came a, a character who uh, who had uh, a dignity and integrity and intelligence uh, I think the sense was that uh, this was a this was a person that uh, that you could uh, believe and count on uh, that wouldn't be involved with hypocrisy, uh, duplicity. Um, there was a hunger then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think so. I think he filled, him, filled him, uh, served the great hunger. Absolutely. Uh, and I think too that uh, we were ready for the idea of a friendly alien. Well, that's right. How, how do you feel, by the way, about the role itself? You'll be Mr. Spock, of course, forever. Uh, do you do you ever get resentful of that? No, I'm I'm very comfortable with it. That's why the last book that I wrote, I Am Spock, uh, is, is titled the way it is. I've, I've really come full circle with it, and I'm totally comfortable. Do you think that Gene Roddenberry uh, would approve of the repeat direction and usage of original characters that have been now exhaustively repeated in, you know, so many other uh, knockoffs? Well, I don't think Gene had any problem with, with perpetuating Star Trek. I think... Uh, I think he would always enjoy the idea of, of, of the success of, of the of the franchise, but I do think that that he would be at least interested uh, in uh, in seeing that the thematic ideas were strong. That, that's what Star Trek really is about when it's at its best. Mm -hmm. Is the is thematic ideas? It should be great entertainment, great adventure, but it should be about something. Yes, and uh, Star Trek always was. Uh, is it moving away from that slowly, the knockoffs? Well, you know, I've, I've got to be honest with you. I don't watch enough of it to pass judgment. Uh, I feel very good about what we did. I feel very good about the the, the TV shows and, and the movies that I was involved with. Uh, I've seen um, generations that I've seen contact, and I'm not really sure that, that they are stories that, that I would have set out to do as major motion pictures. So your reaction to contact was not... I think it was very well done, very well executed. I'm just not... Um, Where uh, was the story? I wasn't blown away with the story. Uh -huh. exactly. uh, go, let's go back to uh, Star Trek for a second. Did you, 
Do you remember the gentleman, and I cannot, who was originally cast as a captain of the Enterprise, uh, Christopher Pike? Oh, yeah, it was Jeffrey Hunter. And what happened to him? Well, Jeffrey Hunter was, was a, a, uh, an important movie star. Uh, he was a very great gentleman and a fine actor. He did the first pilot as, as Captain Pike, and then about a year later, when NBC and Desi Lee decided they wanted to make a second pilot, he simply wasn't available. I'm not sure whether he had another job or whether the negotiations with him got too tough or whatever. That was later brought back as a menagerie, wasn't it? That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> well, I guess you've really already answered this, but uh, with respect to your answer uh, on contact, but otherwise, other television programs, movies, and so forth, um, has anything come close to the, the genre of Star Trek? Um, well, what a, what an interesting question. Um, I saw some a few episodes of Outer Limits that I thought were very interesting. I think X Files has has a great kind of internal life going on. There's, yes. there's a, it, it has a, a certain kind of style and it has an attitude. It has an attitude, and I think that's very important. Um, I think um, um, oh, Babylon Five has an attitude that that, that works at times. That's, that's pretty much it as far as I'm concerned. So, I mean, in my, you know, in my range of experience. Uh, a very trivial question, but important to me nevertheless. In the early episodes, uh, many years actually of Star Trek, uh, the, the women, the S ensigns all had these wonderful uniforms that in later years changed to pants. <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> I don't know, but you know, you, you're touching on them. <laughs> Very interesting point. The um, science fiction, uh, for a long time, was was a, uh, a sub sub genre. It was considered a, uh, a distant cousin of important work. And uh, in fact, when I started acting in science fiction forty five years ago, if you can believe it, in, in um, a Saturday afternoon serial called Zombies of the Stratosphere. <laughs> uh, it was science fiction was a genre in which you saw monsters, you saw people in strange outfits who came from other worlds, and you saw ladies who were scantily dressed. Yes. And uh, there was always some, you know, some sexy aspect to it, um, and that was what you saw in the early days of Star Trek. There were the, the women were. I think Bill Tice did a brilliant job of of dressing or nearly dressing some of the ladies. And uh, and then later on, I guess political correctness and feminism um, came on the scene, and there was some question about whether or not these women shouldn't be wearing more clothes and in their professional situations, and that's what happened. I'm not sure, but I think it's also perhaps as the airline airline stewardesses began to get older too. Yeah, well, that could be. That could be yeah. Um, where did the idea of the all famous Vulcan mind control mind meld come from? Um. We were doing an episode called, I believe, Dagger of the Mind. And um, um, there was an actor playing a character who was mentally deranged. And he had information that we had to have. And the scene as it was written was a kind of a tedious interrogation scene where, uh, where I asked him a lot of questions. And, and got information from him piecemeal, a word here and a word there. And it, it wasn't, wasn't as dramatic as it might be. And Gene Roddenberry came up with this idea that, <laughs> that Vulcans could do this mating of the minds and, and, uh, and extract the information that way. It was, it was kind of a Vulcan, ter Vulcan version of hypnosis. And, uh, and it, it made for a much more dramatic way of getting the information and became a very useful tool for the Spock character. I remember clearly, uh, and I saw every single episode and every single movie. And I remember when you died. I remember when your casket, uh, I thought, flashed and burned in the atmosphere. Yeah. What was it like to uh, to be killed off? <laughs> I had a tough time with it. I had a tough time with it. I took the job because, uh, frankly, I believed that that might be the last Star Trek movie. And uh, and I thought, why not go out in a flash in a blaze of glory, saving the, saving the Enterprise and the crew? and dying in the process. I really thought this might be the last film. By the time we got around to shooting the final scene, the goodbye scene, where I'm saying goodbye to Captain Kirk, um, I, I had the sense that the movie was going to work. And I thought, if this movie is as good as I think it is, there are going to be more. And I began to have second thoughts about what I had done. <laughs> 
but uh, the die was cast, and I was and I was a little late. Uh, it was it was a little too late to do anything about it, except that on the the day we were shooting that scene, Harv Bennett came down on the set and said, "Do you think that you could do something in this scene that would uh, give us a thread to pick up if there is another movie?" And that's when I came up with this idea of doing a mind meld with D. Kelly, and uh, and and simply saying the word "remember." Yes, uh, it was ambiguous enough that uh, that a writer could pick up that idea and remember there might be another. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't um, forget, if there's another movie, if there's another movie, don't forget me. <laughs> right. Um, in search of, a lot of people uh, wrote and asked me to ask you about in yeah. search of whether you ever might pick that up again. Well, uh, I tell you, in search of was a pleasant surprise to me. Again, I thought maybe two or three seasons would would be the stretch of the show. We did seven years, and we did 144 episodes, and I think it became sort of the the model and the granddaddy of a lot of the reality based uh, searching shows that are on the air now. In fact. For the last couple of years, I've been narrating a show called Ancient Mysteries, which which has its own similarities to In Search of. I, I haven't heard any word about In Search of being resurrected, but uh, it's not a bad idea. All right. Um, it was Alan Keyes, a pres presidential candidate in the last uh, election, who said, Star Trek, in many ways, more personifies the spirit of what NASA used to be than does the current NASA. Um would you agree with that? That's interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, I think it's true, but I think just this last week that we've been seeing a revival of interest in NASA. I think they've had an enormous success with the with the Mar rover on Mars, and uh, and I I think that they have gotten out of their kind of bureaucratic bind and gotten into a, an adventurous spirit that's captured the imagination again. And uh, and if that's true, and if they can keep that that kind of sense of adventure going, I think that they might uh, they might build on it successfully. There's still a tremendous interest, I think, in what's out there, and uh, and I think NASA is the the organization that's best set up to do the exploring. A building greater interest than ever in what's out there. More UFO reports, lights right. over Phoenix recently, the celebration of Roswell, all the rest of it. Uh, what about moving into the realm of reality? How much chance do you think there really is that we will be contacted? Uh, there's, uh, I mean, there is so much media. Yeah. Uh, it's almost as though we are being prepared. Yeah. You know, when we were making the Star Trek series, um, the first season, middle of the first season, some people came to me, and they said, you may not know it, but you have been chosen as a, as a, a kind of a a vessel to carry information to this civilization to help prepare this society for the coming of another civilization for alien arrival and uh, your character is a character designed to educate this public that, that there's nothing to fear that, that, that it's possible to interact with other species mm -hmm. and I said okay <laughs> it's okay with me if that's the case and yes, the, it, it, it's ongoing. It doesn't stop. I, I guess I, there's something in me that that responds to it as well. That's why I hooked up with John Delancey and several other Star Trek actors and actresses, and we call ourselves Alien Voices. This group that's doing these these uh, audio tapes, the the journey to the center of the Earth and the time machine and Lost World, and we, you know, I guess we're we're kind of touched by that idea. We're tickled by that idea. We're our imaginations. Are, are uh, awakened, aroused by that idea. I'm curious. I'm very curious. Um, the the Carl Sagan movie that just opened, uh, the book, the, the movie based on Carl Sagan's book Contact just opened. Right. Uh, it's a flawed movie, but what? But I think one of the most important moments in the movie is is when Jodie Foster tells us that the numbers. There are something like four billion stars in our galaxy alone, in our galaxy alone. And there are billions of other galaxies. Each of those stars are potential suns just like ours. And that means that if, if one uh, out of every million uh, of those stars has planets around it, and, and if one, any one out of every million of those 
has some kind of life on it, then that then the numbers tell us that the chances are very, very great that there is life out there someplace. But the distances are immense, yeah. and the technology involved to get here would That's dictate right. they would be far, far ahead of us. Well, not necessarily. They, they might be far ahead of us. They, they might be parallel to us. We don't know that for sure. Uh, but you're right. The chances are they're, they're far ahead of us, yeah. So which, a good question we, is uh, uh, whether you think that beings, not just humans, evolve toward or away from violence. An important question if we're going to meet up with somebody. Yeah, well, that's always the question. How did they, you know, the first thing that we would like to know is how did you folks get through the technological phase of, of your civilization and survive? How did you survive all the discoveries of of atomic weaponry and, and atomic uh, power and that kind of thing without yes. killing each other. Yes. And uh, and the, the assumption is that we'll be able to ask those questions and they'll educate us and help us get through it, you know. It won't necessarily work that way. The, they, they may not... Uh, we, it may take... It may take an enormous amount of time just for us to learn how to communicate with them, let alone uh, to, get to, to, to get information from them. The, the assumption always is that they have traveled the same path that we are traveling, that they may be a hundred or a thousand years ahead of us, but that they have gone through exactly the same experience, and chances are that's not necessarily true. Well, recalling the prime directive, if you look at what we have done here on Earth, you know, reality, when we have met uh, people who have been isolated uh, from the world until one sudden day when they're found in the middle of a jungle somewhere, we destroy them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, I don't know. Listen, uh, on a lighter note, you... Uh, you did some music stuff, didn't you? Yeah, I have dabbled with music in my time. Um, where are you where are you going with this? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I was I just wanted to ask whether there's more. <laughs> there's more coming. Not too many people know that you uh, dabbled with music, do they? Well, music has always been a love of mine, and and when we, when we were doing the Star Trek series, I, I I had the opportunity to do some recording, which I did. I, I think I, I I must have done about six albums. I also did a lot of musical theater. I toured the country in various musical shows in the 70s. I did Fiddler on the Roof, My Fair Lady, King and I, Camelot. Had a wow. great time. I loved doing it. Uh, and then a question I, I, I asked you uh, just before the program, the one I did ask you is, how do you get a life? I mean, how do you... You're so busy, so many demands on your time, and yeah. I'm, I'm one of them right now. How do you make time for a life? Well, first, let me say this. I, uh, when I came to California, I was... 18 years old. I left Boston, came to California to be an actor. Uh, for the first 15 years that I spent working and building a career, I was always wanting more opportunity. I was uh, I was always struggling to get more work. When when it all came together for me, and Star Trek started, and I haven't been out of work since. And then particularly when I had a, a couple of hits direct uh, directing movies, and all of that came together suddenly you're right what happens to you as you know is that there's a tremendous amount of pressure builds up to do this do that and and people would be happy to keep you busy 24 hours a day that's right i i don't resent it because of the time that i spent wanting more and needing more and knowing what it's like being out of work